Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage conference co-chair and partner for Hamburger Gibson Creative, Kelly Gibson. Hello, everybody. Come on in, take a seat. Um, thank you so much for all coming to this Polly's Conference in Nashville. We're very grateful that you're here. Um, yes, I'm one of four chair people for this event, and we wanted to build it in a way that would offer content that was not only um, useful and helpful in our industry, but also enjoyable. And so we've kicked off, this is the second conference in a row, we've kicked off um, with TED style talks. And so that's what you're here for. We, we think it's a thoughtful way to bring you into this conference and start to do that, get you thinking about different elements of politics, of what we do for a living, of how we do what we do for a living. A lot of us are going into a busy election cycle. And so we hope to give you tools to do your work, but also strategies to survive a cycle. And so our first speaker um, is gonna do just that. She, um, she is going to talk to us about how you can find peace and calm in just 60 seconds. So come election day, we can all call her up and thank her for our survival and serenity. So with, without further ado, let's welcome to the stage, Frida Ejet. Thank you everyone so much. Before I get started, can we please thank Alana and Angela and Allison and Jen, all the amazing people at AAPC for organizing this tremendous conference for us. Um, these things are no small feat, as many of us know, and they definitely uh, merit our thanks and appreciation. So, let's get started. How many of you have worked on a campaign? Hands up. Yes, so we're all in this together. Staying in the office till midnight, free basing caffeine, only to come home to get back on email, Facebook stalk people, get FOMO pissy, um, or watch mindless television, falling asleep on the couch, getting in bed if we're lucky, only to wake up feeling hungover with exhaustion and potentially dreading the day. All too often, those of us who work and live and play in politics, from campaign volunteer all the way to members of parliament and Congress, believe that our own personal well-being is something that we have to compromise in order to help those we seek to serve. Just thinking about that woman who works three jobs to support her family, we tell ourselves that we have to go, go, go with a compulsive drive, even though we aren't thriving. What if? In order to improve her life for the better, we get to change ours first. I know this all too often, and it's too true. 10 years ago, I was on the outside at the top of my game. I was building and scaling political organizations that were gaining statewide recognition. I was advising winning legislative battles in 25 states. I was a county commissioner. I was even considering a run for office myself. And on the inside, I was battling and struggling excuse me, with a devastating eating disorder that ruled me and controlled me and disconnected me from being authentic and whole. So I hit a bottom, finally, hallelujah, <laughs> and went on sabbatical and moved to London to earn my master's in organizational and social psychology. For the first time in a decade, without my feet actively on the ground, working on a campaign, I saw a trend from 5,000 feet away, or 5,000 feet, 5,000 miles away. That would be pretty close, right? And I saw a theme that those of us that cared the most deeply about our political space were potentially self-sabotaging. Not all of us struggles from an eating disorder, but many of us do have a hurdle or a barrier and interference that gets in our way of performing as our best self. So I had an aha moment that I wasn't meant to lobby, I was meant to listen, and became a certified executive coach, hell-bent on bringing authenticity and well-being to help political leaders operate at peak performance levels in service to the greater good. So I moved back to the United States, it was 2013, I've been doing that precisely that ever since. 
So I came back and I started studying very, very meticulously political intelligence, neuroscience, social psychology, authentic leadership, mindfulness, and even elite athletics, thinking, you know, like, what would Kobe do or Stephen Curry do in this situation? And blending the theory and practices together into these micro strategies that could be applied anywhere, at any time, by anyone, especially in those brief moments of pause in the intensities and rigor of political life. I started working with campaign operatives, with elected officials, with civil servants, and even the noble men and women of our Pentagon that are keeping us safe. And we saw significant impacts on stress management, improved decision making, honed vision, building resiliency, and powerfully connecting across divides. And together, we made meaningful change. A parliamentarian was caught in indecision, and through the power of visualization a la Olympians, <laughs> She was able to gain clarity and powerfully bring a committee to make a decision on an innovative reform. A civil servant suffered from fierce anxiety and through simple breathing exercises was able to regain a sense of calm and compellingly speak in public. A mayor felt he had lost his way and through a series of simple, powerful questions was able to reconnect with that energizing vision that propelled him into public service in the first place. And the best part is, many of these things just take a matter of minutes. So, to kick us off, why don't we do one right now? What do you think? Yeah. So this one is called the Political Leader Mindful Minute. So indulge me, just get comfortable, make sure your feet are anchored firmly and evenly on the ground. Maybe roll your shoulders back a bit. If you're anything like me, you might hold tension in your shoulders. Loosen your jaw. And put your hands at your side and your lap, whatever feels comfortable and natural to you. And when you're ready, close your eyes and connect with the inhale and exhale of your breath. Breathing in through your nose and out through your nose and again. If at any moment, at any time, your thoughts wander, congratulate yourself for noticing. Yes, this is what minds do. They're curious. They explore. This time as you breathe in, think of a word or a phrase that uniquely describes you as a political leader. And as you breathe out, your greatest contribution to society. Breathing in again, this word that describes you uniquely as a political leader and out your greatest unique contribution to society. And in a moment, I'm gonna start a timer for 60 seconds. And all you need to do is count your exhale. For example, breathing in, breathing out, one. Breathing in, breathing out, two. And I'll see you in a minute and begin. Welcome back. <laughs> so that was 60 seconds. Take note of how many breaths you took at any point, at any time, no matter where you are or who you are and you feel yourself revving up or wanting to disengage, count your breaths that number of times or set a minute on your smartphone and reset. What happens in political life is that a stress hormone called cortisol floods our brains and bodies, impeding our decision-making, our judgment, our ability to communicate and connect. 
It's like we're being charged by a giant wildebeest, except we probably aren't. What this simple breath exercise does is it calms our nervous system, our nervous system, getting us out of a state called fight or flight and back into a place of calmness and control. And that's all it takes, one minute. So here's my challenge for you. This is a three-day conference. Each day, and today's already taken care of, take one political leader mindful minute. You can accept or reject your counteroffer, that's the deal. Who accepts? Yeah, so give the person next to you a high five and say like boom or something like that. Yes, awesome. Little vacations left and right. And that's how it begins. Listen, y'all, I know that the stakes are really high right now. That's why we're here today. That's why we show up day after day after day, time and again, no matter what. Our unique source of power is our ability to shape America and our democracy. Do not abandon that or relinquish it and give it away. So thank you so much for who you are and that all you do. My name is Frida Ejet. I genuinely appreciate you. And don't forget to take a sec to reset. Have a good one. Thank you, Frida. So um, any cord cutters in the room? Or people that watch shows on your phone, or your tablet, or TV, or all at the same time, all of that. Our next speaker can tell us a little something about the way people are consuming information. So please welcome to the stage, Nick Garamoni. I first want to start off by thanking Frida for helping me calm down the flu. This presentation in front of 535 people. My mic is not on. Is my mic on? OK, thanks, Zach. Oh, I'm a little bit too loud here. In 1990, as an undergraduate biochemistry major, I, through a series of fortunate events, got an internship at the top-rated TV station in Denver, Colorado. And it was at the TV station in those early years, and frankly not at the lab, where I learned about the ability for television to inspire and to engage. It was also at that time, strangely enough, that I developed a passion for local television advertising. So throughout my early jobs in local broadcast and local cable, I knew that television wasn't really good at targeting or using data, not sophisticated at all. But having a science background and being enthralled by technology, I knew one day would come when things would change. And that day came a few years ago, but today, we are seeing a revolution in the way that people consume television content. They're getting better content anywhere they want, as much as they want, whenever they want. And for advertisers, organizations, and candidates, this truly is television advertising's renaissance. Though you wouldn't think so if you read the apocalyptic headlines in the paper about the death of television. Well, I'm here to tell you that the death of television has been greatly over-exaggerated. Now, you can't blame people because we're all enamored with these devices, the smartphone, the iPad, the desktop connected televisions, et cetera. And quite frankly, the digital industry has some compelling offers, including and especially in advertising. What we haven't done a good job of, and what I haven't done as good of a job of, is really describing the connection people have with TV. In fact, if you take a look at fourth quarter, according to Nielsen, an average adult spent more than 31 hours consuming television. And in the cable industry where I work, we're putting all of our resources to ensure that our subscribers can get the same content on the big screen as a little screen on the left. Television is truly everywhere today. Now, the number one reason why people spend so much time with TV is because our industry spends tens of billions of dollars to produce and deliver high-quality, brand-safe content. There are hundreds of series that come out every year, and literally thousands of sporting events where local fans get to watch their favorite teams. And, of course, there's a surfeit of news out there. 
It's probably no surprise that the activities over the past couple of years have driven up viewership to national cable networks and other cable and other news sources out there. But what may surprise you is that 86% of the time people spend with television content, it's ad supported. And that was in 2017. That same number, that same ratio was happening in 2007. Now, we've always known that the content is engaging and the messages within that content is engaging. Well, today, the ability to target those messages is becoming more sophisticated. That means that you can send a message or messages at a state, congressional district, county, neighborhood, even individual household level. And with all of the resources being poured into moving that content into multiple devices, those messages can now be delivered inside of multiple screens. Plus, the cable industry is expanding our capacity to be able to addressably deliver those messages within on-demand and live programming. Now, we've got all of the content, and we have all of the abilities to go ahead and target. We just need the fuel, and that's data. And this is where I really get excited, because I've been working with some really smart people and we've wrestled the enormity of set-top box data and other digital viewing data and matched it with voter files and consumer information so that we know what people are watching and when they're watching them. And then we can identify high concentrations of those targets and put together campaigns to go ahead and deliver message with, messages within those targets. I do need to pause here because at all levels of our industry, we take protecting and respecting people's information very, very seriously. So now, you've heard me talk about my enthusiasm for television, you've heard me talk about my excitement about television advertising, and you know that I'm a data geek because I love data and analytics overall. The other thing that I love about what I do for work is to take the complex and make it simple. In fact, I actually tease my peers that I am the CSO in the industry, the Chief Simplification Officer. My first role, I think we all need one of those, right? Maybe even at home. And my first role in local cable was to take the complexity of delivering a local cable advertising campaign across 2,600 individual geographies and dozens of networks and be able to deliver that in just a few easy transactions. Well, hundreds of us over the past few years in collaboration with the political community and especially with the advertising community have been working on taking all of those amazing advancements that I just described and weaving them into campaigns, advertising campaigns that can be targeted anywhere in the country, including all the way down to the household level. What we've done is we've been able to take data, all the screens that are available to us, package it up in an ad tech enabled e-business platform. So my colleagues at NCC Media and everybody else, our peers throughout the industry, can create powerful, targeted advertising video campaigns at scale, very simply. So I started my story um, 28 years ago for you guys, if you were doing the math, alluding to my love of science. And I described very briefly how all throughout television we have advanced. I'm excited to say that when I look back over the past three decades, my two passions have converged. And what I'm really excited about for me and my colleagues and for everybody in the advertising community is what the future is gonna bring for us in television, in advertising, and quite frankly, for the consumers who are watching our product. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. I feel like my viewing habits probably tell the world exactly what I am, a feminist, progressive, political consultant. And here all these years, I thought that was a choice that I'd made to be just that. But our next speaker, Michael Long, thinks otherwise, that maybe I was just wired that way. So let's welcome to the stage Michael Long. <laughs> You had some choice in the matter, I'm sure, that's it. 
Thanks for being here. The brain is a complex thing, but in one way, it's kind of simple. It divides the world along a single axis into things that are near and things that are far away. Now, things that are near are things we can control immediately, like our watch or a cell phone, but things that are far away, if we want to control them, we have to plan and calculate. And whether this is uh, you know, reaching across the table for salt or flying to the moon, to the brain, it's exactly the same kind of challenge. So the question is, why would the brain divide the world this way? Well, it has to do with nothing less than the meaning, the purpose of life. Now, you and I can argue all day long about what the purpose of life might be, but when it comes to the realm of science, the matter is settled. The purpose of life is to keep living. And we need a lot of things if we're going to do that, but in particular, we need shelter, we need food, and we have to propagate the species. Or as I like to put it, uh, rent gets paid, uh, dinner gets made, uh, and we all get, to, well, <laughs> moving right along. None of these things, unfortunately, can be found nearby. If we want them, uh, we have to go across that axis and, and look for them. And fortunately, the brain has equipped us with a system to help us do that. It makes us want these things, and it gives us uh, the means to figure out how to get them. This is the dopamine system. Whenever we encounter something new that might be useful to us, we get a little buzz the dopamine buzz. And you know this feeling. You're walking down the street, you hear that ding off your cell phone, might be something good. Yeah, you know that feeling. Now, if you happen to be a caveman, this is an excellent system to have because it keeps you on the hunt for the things you need to stay alive. But if you have an apartment or a hotel room here, and, and you have uh, directions on your phone to the grocery store, and you can use Tinder? If it's 2018, you don't need this system so much, but it turns out that your brain doesn't know it's 2018. And this dopamine drive has to go somewhere, and it does. It affects how we conduct ourselves in business and culture, it affects how we fall in love, it affects immigration, and it affects politics. Now, we all have some dopamine, and that's necessary, but some of us have more than others, and this can be for better and for worse. For instance, if you have high dopamine in the part of your brain that allows you to make connections, well, this might make you very creative. For instance, better stay away from those who carry around a fire hose. You don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. That's Bob Dylan's subterranean homesick blues. If you can think like that, good for you. But what if you couldn't stop? You might end up with racing thoughts at best, or at worst, what psychiatrists call word salad, which is a symptom of schizophrenia. Another example. What if you had high dopamine in the part of your brain that allows you to calculate and plan? Well, this might make you very good at business, but that can go off the rails as well. We all know people who are ambitious, and then we know, I'll use the nice word, cutthroats. People who are shooting for the top, but they're not satisfied when they get there. That's because they're not doing it for the reward at the end of the line. They're doing it for the more, more, more dopamine buzz all along the way. And when they get to the top, they're still not satisfied. And that, that need, that urge has to go somewhere, and it does. For instance, have you noticed that many of the offenders in the Me Too movement are often high-powered CEOs and celebrities? There you go. Have you noticed or have you wondered why winners cheat? That's why. Or to take it down a level, have you, have you ever noticed that the, the person most likely to afford a beach house is least likely to enjoy it? You know why? Because there's, there's no dopamine buzz associated with sitting in an Adirondack chair on the eastern shore. It just doesn't happen. And that brings me to politics. Now the facts are pretty simple. Nothing new in this. If you're a self-described conservative, you say you want, among other things, 
to hold on to the things you have. If you're a self-described progressive, you want, among other things, action and change, and you want it right now. So it won't surprise you when I tell you that, on average, in the main, progressives have more dopamine than conservatives. So what are the consequences? Just this. Running for office and running the government call on planning and calculation and creativity, just the things that give a neurochemical reward to people with high dopamine, people on the left. Now, I've heard it said that reality has a liberal bias, and I'm not going to get into that with you all. There's no way I would touch that. But I will say that government absolutely has a liberal bias because government exists to do things. Government takes action. If progressivism is the hand, government is the glove. Not by nature of its policies, but by nature of its nature. Now, if that's true, you ought to want to know how in the world we have conservative politicians at all. And of course, we do, but they're just not very good at making major conservative change. It just doesn't happen. <clears throat> and that's because dopamine favors action. And government action is rarely the path to conservative ends. Conservatives favor market forces and individual action like that, not so much coordination and planning. And if you happen to be on that side, it gets even worse. Wait and see is a perfectly reasonable position to take on a whole lot of issues. But, but what is it that voters complain about all the time? Do-nothing politicians. So, <clears throat> I'm not going to say that we don't have any high dopamine conservatives and low dopamine liberals. Of course, of course we do. And, and we're not slaves to dopamine. We, uh, except for addiction, we have a choice as to what we're going to do. And of course, political, political choice depends on so many other factors. But I am saying that in the main, the level of dopamine in any given individual tends to point us in one direction or the other. And the people you work for and with every day, the people who are taking hard, solid action in this area, are going to, most of the time, prefer action over inaction and power over passivity. And now you know why. One more thing. Dopamine is like a riga behind the victorious Caesar. But instead of whispering, memento homo, you're only a man. Dopamine shouts, and it shouts one thing. Wouldn't you like to have more? Thanks. I don't know what you all took away from Michael, but what I took away is that the Democrats are going to win bank in 2018. Is that what, that's what, that's what I heard. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. So next up, we have um, Thomas Peters on the stage, and Thomas has a real story for us about changing one's life in the face of tragedy and obstacles, and how you can turn it into something real and good, and as it turns out, effective. So let's welcome Thomas. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Do they have a clicker for me, perhaps? Thank you so much. Sure. I won't make everyone raise their hands, because I know, even though we're all campaigners, a lot of us aren't joiners. But just ask yourself, have I checked my phone in the last five minutes? Now ask yourself, uh, in this next seven minute speech, will I probably check my phone again? And if you're like me, the answer is yes. And that's the first point of my speech. We live in this thing called the attention economy. Time is our most precious asset, and attention is the way we spend it. As political consultants, we need to adapt to this new paradigm. Now, I came to this realization about the importance of time and attention 
on election night in 2012. I was at a Mitt Romney victory party in downtown DC. We realized early in the night that we had lost big league. So the party quickly dev devolved into a bunch of depressed people sitting around an open bar. It was about that fun. I remember feeling hurt, angry, frustrated, defeated, and so like any responsible millennial, I went on to my smartphone and I started complaining. I started texting my friends and family back in Michigan, really blaming them, saying, why didn't you do more? Why didn't you like do more than just go out and vote? And they pushed back and they said, hey, politics isn't our full-time job. We have to live our lives. We voted, what else are we supposed to do? And I realized that we were all using our smartphones that night to complain about losing, but there wasn't a single dedicated app that I as a Republican could use to organize with and win. We were not making it easy for people who had real lives to do the important things that we were always begging them to do, like donate, door knock, send messages, recruit their friends, etc. And when they did do something, we never rewarded them or recognized them. We didn't have their attention. And that's why apps are eating the world as we know it. The practical ones reward us for the time we spend with them. They make our lives easier and simpler and they occupy our attention. Did you know that 90% of all time we spend on our smartphones is spent on an app? How many of you since I began this uh, talk have already probably checked your phones? I bet you it was an app that distracted you. And that's the idea driving my company, you campaign. Capture the attention of your top supporters, where they live, on their smartphones, and make it as easy as possible for them to take action quickly. Great ideas sometimes get interrupted. On July 16th, 2013, a little less than three months after I got married, I um, was at a friend's house on the water and I had a terrible swimming accident that left me a paralyzed quadriplegic in a wheelchair. After multiple surgeries, three months in two hospitals, I came home, discharged uh, by my insurance, out of work, and began a grueling two-year regime of physical rehabilitation to recover whatever function I could. When I came home, all I could really do was shrug my shoulders and move my head back and forth. Perhaps the cruelest thing that sunk in during this time was I realized I wasn't going to be a hotshot political consultant anymore. I wasn't going to be a spokesperson. I wasn't going to be flying around the country, pulling 18-hour days, hopping on TV shows, um, networking late into the night. And then one day, I remember very vividly, I learned how to hold my phone again. And I realized that my accident, even though it had closed a lot of doors, was giving me an opportunity that I would have otherwise not had. The opportunity was to found the company that I dreamed of on election night 2012. I decided I would try to build the app that would help the next Republican win the White House, and that dream came true for me. Here's how we did it. We found a backer, I found one developer, and in July of 2014, we went to work. Everything I told you about the attention economy and the need for speed and ease we put into the alpha version of the app. First of all, we tried to make it as easy as possible to do any action, five seconds or less. Uh, we tried to make sure the app had relevant information and content so it was actually useful. And the biggest breakthrough was gamification. I spent, or wasted if you ask my mom, a lot of time in my youth playing computer games. I knew that, it, that gamification got me hooked. And so we tried to make our app fun and social because at the end of the, end of the day, we're competing for people's attention. That's the enemy, how distracted people are. And so for every action, you earn points, or as we call them, action points, AP. Lots of AP earned you a badge, and that badge appeared next to you on the app's social timeline so you could stand out and be impressive in front of your friends. By the way, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all these social networks use gamification, the number of followers, the number of likes. We simply expanded that concept to every single thing. It might be hard to see, but these are screenshots from a bunch of our apps where people are posting the top badge that they've earned, bragging about it, and then they're getting, we're talking about dopamine earlier, they're getting likes and responses from other people saying, good job, keep going. Um, 
our savviest clients take this concept of gamification and extend it into the real world with things like bumper stickers and Star Wars tickets for Ted Cruz supporters or front row seats at the kickoff rally for Danilo Medina's top supporters in the Dominican Republic. Again, anything that grabs people's attention and gets them more addicted to the app. Our ideas and our theories got their first encounter with reality when we launched the official Ted Cruz app on July 7th, 2015, which we built from the ground up using our U campaign platform. We didn't start with five-star reviews. I remember that very vividly. But we iterated and improved on our concept by reading thousands of pieces of feedback from Ted Cruz's top digital activists, and we built the app that they asked for, social news feed, user profiles and timelines, social plugins, more ways to earn points, dozens of action types. And that's how he kept his supporters engaged over the nine months that we ran his campaign. By the end of it, the app had been downloaded uh, over 90,000 times. Supporters accomplished 1.5 million actions just, for giving out, just by giving out bumper stickers and t-shirts, uh, including 350,000 peer-to-peer messages and we invented a feature that allowed a user to see in the app which of their friends and family were most likely to support Cruz, and we asked them to send a personal message encouraging them to vote for him. We started out by having his supporters send about 3,800 of these personalized messages to people walking into the 2016 Iowa caucuses, which Cruz won by slightly over 6,000 votes. This was a message from a friend or family member they knew so we knew it would grab their attention, and we did this for every primary going forward. Again, the magic was capturing people's attention. After Cruz, we built the official UK Vote Leave app, which was the craziest three weeks of my life, but I'm not allowed to talk about it because I don't have enough time. You'll have to invite me back next year if you want to hear that story. When it came to building the official uh, Donald Trump for President app, we had the experience of the Cruz and Brexit apps behind us. We knew which kind of actions people liked, what was the best ways to motivate them, and how to keep their attention. Daily check-in bonus, weekly leaderboards, live videos of rallies, and how to get them to engage their wider audience, personal invite codes, crowdfunding tools, et cetera. By election day, 150,000 Trump supporters had downloaded the app. They had performed 1.2 million actions. And in the final seven weeks, that included 300,000 of these peer-to-peer get-out-the-vote messages targeting persuadable voters in swing states. And these are some of the badges they came up with, all the way from apprentice to big league. By this point, at the end of the election, we'd made, it, we'd made it so easy for a supporter to have an impact that within five minutes of downloading the app, if they said yes, we would scan their contacts and show them all the people they knew that we believed would vote for Trump. And it gave them a pre-scripted message to send personally that would match that recipient's top issue. So it asked me to send my mom in Michigan a message saying that only Trump will repeal Obamacare, and it asked me to send a text to my aunt in Florida uh, saying that only Trump had a plan to build the wall. This is nothing like what we had in 2012. It was easy, effective, and fun, and it worked. In 2017, we expanded the U campaign idea to 12 countries. We've now produced over 50 apps. Our goal in 2018, because you can't run an election the way you did the, even the year before, in 2018, the idea is to grab everyone's attention, not just your top supporters who will download an app. The way to do that is peer-to-peer -peer text messaging. Uh, in 2018, text will be the new email. Our new app, RumbleUp, is our way to grab everyone's attention by a, being able to send them a peer-to-peer -peer text message from a real person, even if they haven't opted in. Our goal is to send 75 million of these in 2018. Because we know, if you think about it for a moment, if I sent you a text message, would it grab your attention? The answer is yes. That's half the goal. Sometimes the most wonderful opportunities in life come about as a result of the worst things that could ever happen to you. If it wasn't for my accident nearly five years ago, I would probably still be working in a cubicle, and I wouldn't have been able to start the company that achieved the successes that brought me here to this stage today. So to my wife and to the small, crazy, dedicated team that made this all possible, thank you. You rock.
I'll just close by saying that if you want to get my attention, the best way to do that is to text me. And thank you so much for yours. Well, as evidence of this association's commitment to bipartisan content, we're going to go from Republican presidential campaigns to the young Democrats of America. We all know that in this country, um, our population is diversifying, more and more communities are changing, and we know from this off cycle 2017 that when you engage with those kinds of voters, you can win some races. We learned that in Alabama. Our next speaker, China Dickerson, is going to tell us more about how to engage in these diversifying times. Let's welcome China. Hello, everyone. Uh, my background matches my shoes. I just wanted to point that out. Uh, <laughs> so two things. Uh, one of them you're very well aware. The other, for some, is an inconvenient truth. One white men run everything, from Wall Street to Main Street and even politics. Two, the white men comprise only 31% of the U.S. population. Despite men comprising only one-third of the population, 97% of all Republican elected officials are white, and 76% are male. Of all Democrats, 79% are white, and 65% are male. Not only do white men sit in an overwhelming majority of elected seats, they're also the majority of political consultants. So before I go any further, let me be clear, usually I'm partisan, uh, but this isn't a Democrat party problem or Republican party problem. This is a bipartisan issue. As of 2014, the Census Bureau reports that 38% of the population is non-white, rising to majority minority by 2044. And according to exit polls in 2016, 30% of the voting electorate was non-white. If the voting electorate trend is consistent with the population trend, more and more voters will be non-white. With that, shouldn't political representation reflect the diversity of the country? And to appeal to those voters, shouldn't candidates consult experts from various backgrounds? Listen, the problem in America is that we are fighting to be colorblind, gender dismissive, and faith indifferent. Human beings are complex, and our differences make us beautiful. What we need is a more reflective representation. I am black, in case you didn't notice. Um, I identify as a woman. I'm 5'10", though I love heels, 200 pounds, and though I look 26 years old, I'm actually 34. Um, <laughs> You don't know me, but I'm pretty great. Ask my friends, not all of them. I'll tell you specifically which ones. Um, my point is that I, all, I would like you all to accept who I am and appreciate my experience and what I can offer to this nation. If we all accepted the diversity each of us bring, we would encourage a more diverse pool of candidates, elected officials, and political consultants. So I've shown you the problem. Now let's talk about solutions. Don't you just hate people that complain and complain? They're not like, they're C people, not P people, not solutions oriented people. Well, I won't be that person today. Let me help you help us. First, we need a bigger pool of women and people of color candidates. Yes. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> uh, since the 2016 election, you all may know, over 30,000 women, it's more now actually, um, have contacted a political organization about, to how, about establishing a campaign, how to run a campaign. More importantly, women make up more, this qualifier is important, more than 50% of the population. With these numbers, we should start to see more women running for office and winning, and we are, but if you talk to women, they will say that they're still having difficulty, right? They're still facing people who have been in office for a long time, multiple terms, incumbents, right? And they still have difficulty in raising large, raising large amounts of money. The solution, less invest in organizations that prime women to run for office, and less donate more to women candidates. 
If women and people of color start to see that it's easier to raise money, then that sets an example for the next generation, the next cycle of candidates. Second, we need a bigger pool of women and people of color political consultants. Black women, as you know, blew up, maybe blew up isn't the right, turned out and voted very heavily in the Alabama, Virginia, New Jersey elections and many others, right? We are seeing Latinos speak louder and spend more money in their communities. Asians continue to dominate the tech sectors. So shouldn't candidates running in communities with these demos seek the advice of experts that most relate to those community members? Now, I started off talking about white men. I'm gonna to continue to do that. <laughs> We're still seeing high-level campaign jobs in elected offices being dominated by white men. So no shade to white men, but I hesitate to believe that a white man who grew up in California with wealthy parents and a postgraduate degree understands the struggle, able to sympathize, but we're talking about empathy, empathizes with a woman immigrant, 22 years old, raising a child on her own with her predominant language being Spanish. The solution, do you work for a, for, do you work for a firm with everyone looks like you or comes from a similar background as you? Strike up a conversation with the partners of your firm about diversity and inclusion and make sure to emphasize the positions of, of power. If you want to help your clients, you'll give them the best tools and the best advice. Third, we need to not suppress voting. Now, before the boos and the cheers, I understand that this issue has partisan critiques, but I'll spare you that, I'll spare, spare you that and just stick to what I think we can all agree on. Why the hell is election day on a Tuesday, a work day, and typically doing work hours? If you have more than one job, if you have to drop and pick up your children from school, if your polling place is not near where you work, then election day being on Tuesday is ridiculous. And guess who it disenfranchises? Women and people of color. Because those groups of people are more likely to not have the flexibility in their schedules to allow them to go into work late or leave early. The fix is to make election day on the weekend like Louisiana's been doing for decades, or let's make it a holiday. Let's show people that we understand that while they don't have the most flexible schedules or lives, their contribution to the political process is necessary and, val and valued. Is this mission impossible? We continue to perpetuate and fight to break barriers that prevent women and people of color from being supported in our political systems. But you can change this. We can change this. So if you work in politics, the first thing you can do when you go home or even on your smartphone, as we just heard, I'm sure some of you are. Actually, no, most of you are looking at me. This is good. <laughs> this is good. Uh, shoot a text to a woman, to a person of color, and ask them if they've ever considered running for office. If they're finding it difficult to get out and vote and why, if they have an interest in working in politics, or if they're willing to collaborate with you to work with a candidate, elected official, or political organization. And if you do not know any women or people of color, we have a different problem. <laughs> Let's make America the place we all want it to be. Let's pull more people into the process. Let's believe in each other. Let's find the value in women. Let's find the value in people of color. This country's electorate is changing with or without us. Let's embrace it. Thank you. All right, political, political consultants, let's take a minute and imagine what it would be like if we celebrated our losses as much as our wins. It's a great idea, right? Come on up, Catherine Poindexter, tell us about that. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. So I'm hoping uh, I can convince you patriotic Americans to love losing as much as I do. Uh, <laughs> when I hear about elections around the world, democratic elections around the world, I uh, most quickly unleash the finger quotes, democratic elections, 
when we hear that there's a race that is literally or nominally uncontested. When someone's on the ballot with no opponent, there's no opportunity for debate or accountability, and it's easier for power to maintain its tight grip on power. So, imagine my dismay at learning that here in the US, uh, many of our state and federal legislators get their jobs uh, by winning elections that are literally or nominally uncontested. In 2016, four out of 10 state races were uncontested in the general election. Four out of 10. That means either Republicans or Democrats said, hmm, we're not likely to win this one, we don't need to play. Uh, <laughs> it's a big problem ideologically, right? But thinking purely practically, it creates some challenges for us as well. Specifically, it means we're missing business. Nobody got to work in these four out of 10 state ledge races. Uh, another place we're missing business is primaries. Um, hello, that's my pointer, there we go. Uh, most incumbents in state legislatures and in Congress were not challenged in primaries. This is a key place where values and accountability are driven forward, and those challenges aren't happening either. If you add up all these races, it's over 8,000 missing opportunities from our marketplace. Those are spots on the ballot where nobody ran, there was no mail program, there was no general consultant, nobody was producing ads. So whether you look at it ideologically or from a bottom line standpoint, it's a big opportunity. So why aren't people running? Here's where I think our expertise is really key. People in this room know better than anybody else why not to run for office, yes? So everybody think of one reason. We're gonna all shout it out together on the count of three. Ready, just one reason, just one. Ready? Are people in for this? Okay, great. <laughs> one, two, three. Okay, from this key cutting edge qualitative research, I pulled uh, two, two reasons people don't run. One is that they feel unsupported. Folks don't know where to start. They don't know who to call, they don't know how to raise money, they don't know how to put together a team, and they don't know where to start. So my first challenge for us as an industry is to figure out a new business model to support people who want to run for office. Uh, figure out a business model, and I will tell you, I'm not counting selling them logos on nail files and potholders. Um, let's find a business model that pays us for our time and supports them in a way that they need to be supported. So a value add that gets them all the way through the election. Uh, okay, what's another reason not to run for office? I heard this one already. Let's say it again together. One, two, three. Okay, I went with losing. <laughs> I think you guys got to losing before I did. People don't want to lose. I don't want to lose. I have uh, one friend who refuses to play Monopoly with me because I don't want to lose. Um, I imagine I'm not alone. Uh, when I hear about a candidate, a new candidate who's running for office, sometimes the first thing out of my mouth is, oh, can he win? And this seems weird to me set against the, what we see happening across America every weekend. How many of you are parents? Yes, parents. Um, how many of your kids play sports? How many of your kids win every game? I've seen Kelly's kids play. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, at the same time that we're telling candidates, ooh, let's maybe wait for a race that you can win, we're sending our kids out every weekend <laughs> to go <laughs> get their butts kicked on the soccer field, <laughs> or uh, otherwise lose. And the reason is that, you know, we all know this in our gut, there are a number of strategic reasons to lose. There are a number of lessons that you learn showing up and playing, showing up and losing, that you can't learn any other way. That's how you become a competent adult human. So it's not that far of a leap to remind you that there are a number of strategic reasons to have a candidate on a ballot even if they're gonna lose. 
Uh, we can all think of any number of advantages that incumbents have, right? There's the incumbent advantage. What if that's not an incumbent advantage? What if that's a veteran candidate advantage? What if you get that just by running again a second time, whether you won or lost the first time? If we can shift our thinking and remember that losing has a strategic place, can be a key part of a long-term strategy, we can make it a little easier for candidates to run for office. Um, people sometimes need to be able to visualize this, so I talk about two trajectories in particular. Um, one, lose big, then win small. People say, oh, I want to be a state legislator. I suggest, let's run statewide first, or let's run for Congress first. And it freaks people out, but if you think about everything that you accomplish, even in a losing congressional race, uh, you get a lot of the way there. So the next, when you're filing for state ledge, it's that much easier. The flip side of this is the Katie Ledecky strategy. She's my favorite Olympic swimmer at the moment. And the, this strategy is built on the idea that it's a marathon, not a sprint. You can't swim every race holding your breath. You wait until you're at the Olympics to hold your breath. There are any number of candidates, parents, people who work full time, people who are taking care of their parents, who don't have the opportunity in their lives to remortgage their house, to quit their jobs, to renegotiate their childcare agreements. And so if we can help them start to run in a training kind of way, we're more likely to set them up down the road. And you and I both know the secret that once they start to run, opportunities are going to pop up a lot faster than they think. So those are two ways I help people think about losing as part of a long-term strategy. And this is my second challenge to us as an industry, is let's not be this guy. <laughs> let's not tell people that there's no such thing as second place. Let's be these coaches, and let's ask our candidates, what are the long-term goals of this race? Let's remind people that they're building skills and uh, consolidating organizations and people. And let's remind them that they need to just get back out on the field. We have a real opportunity to both grow our business and strengthen our democracy over the long run. So hip hip hooray for losing. Yay, losing. <laughs> Thanks. We've been doing a lot of talking about other people, about voters in America, and I think it's time we think about ourselves again, right? So this next guest is going to help us be our badass self all the way through the campaign. Let's welcome Jason Syme. Thank you. All right, everyone. Stand up. We're going to do some yoga. I'm just kidding. All right. 13 years ago, this was me. 75 pounds heavier than I am today. At the time, I would say, I'm in the best shape of my life. I would tell my friends, I'm in fantastic shape. You're not in good shape. Look at me, I'm in great shape. Until I started to have an irregular heartbeat. So I went to a cardiologist. And the cardiologist ran all the normal tests that they do, the stress tests, had me on the tread treadmill, and everything that you do to make sure that everything's okay. And as he was going through the results with me, he was sitting, and I was sitting on a table, and he looked at me, and I was telling him, I'm in great shape. I just ran a marathon. I'm in fantastic. And he looked at me, and he goes, took his hand. He reached out, grabbed my stomach, and said, you ran a marathon with this? Whoa, some doctor that I had. Meanwhile, I was getting ready to run my first congressional race. I got involved in politics because I grew up in poverty. My mom was a single mother of six kids. She raised us on her own. We spent a brief time homeless. We actually lived in an abandoned women's shelter. And that time inspired me to want to help other people that were struggling. My passion for wanting to help other people that were struggling ultimately ended up hurting myself. I managed the stress of the campaigns by smoking cigarettes, abusing alcohol, and taking antidepressants. 
often I would wake up in the morning and go, where am I? And where the hell is my car? A few times I woke up going, hey, I can't get out of here. What's going on? Because I was in jail. After every election, I joked with my friends. I'm the modern version of Humpty Dumpty. I need a few months to put Jason back together again. I'd be slowly putting myself step by step back together again. Before I knew it, I'd be back on the campaign trail, slowly unraveling at the seams, running on an empty tank rather than a full. Somewhere along the way, I found yoga in Las Vegas of all places. And I discovered that the greatest tool is the self-care of you. Because when you take care of yourself, it allows you to truly be able to take care, ter care of others. In the yoga room, I don't see Republicans or Democrats. I see people practicing their own self-care by stretching their bodies. Cancer doesn't care who you voted for. Heart disease doesn't care if your candidate wins the election. Obesity doesn't care if you came from rural America or the inner cities. I've always admired the ability of leaders to use words to inspire movements or start conversations or highlight a latent issue. Campaign speeches and slogans have a way of penetrating our souls, asking us to think differently about a subject or spurring us into action. In accepting the Republican nomination, George H.W. Bush called for a kinder, gentler nation. How do we get to a kinder, gentler nation? Well, it requires change. The change we need, as Obama said in his campaign. The change I'm advocating for today will not happen on election day. It will happen when you decide to make it happen. It starts by asking a question that prioritizes your own self-care that we need to ask ourselves daily. Inspired by John F. Kennedy, the question is, ask not what your body can do for you, ask what you can do for your body, mind, and spirit. How we answer that question, whether it is practicing yoga, or reading romance novels like my mom, or practicing the mindful minute, will give us more energy so we can pour it back into the work we do. It will help us come up with common sense solutions that benefit all Americans regardless of political party. It will help us heal the nation and give us the freedom to truly prosper. And to paraphrase another Kennedy, each time a person stands up for the right to take care of themselves or moves their body or fights for the self-care of others, it sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And building each other from a million different centers of energy, those ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of partisanship and create policies the United Nation. I end with a story that highlights the power of this ripple effect. A month ago, I received an email from a veteran about my coaching services. A veteran who had served seven, time, seven tours in the Special Forces. He was inspired by my story of transformation. I was inspired by his story. After several emails, he wrote to me, and I quote, he said, in reaching out to you, I think it made me realize that the shared consciousness we have as humans is something truly sacred. Today, I'm reaching out to you. It's far past the time to act. The time is now. We do have something special as humans. It starts with us being kinder, gentler to ourselves. What good is freedom if we don't have the help to benefit from it? And how can we ever expect to come up with policies that benefit the nation if when we sit down at the table to negotiate, we're running on empty? We all have the right to shine. First, we must take that initial step and ask, what can I do for my body, mind, and spirit? When we do that, we will have the next political movement made up of people, not parties. Thank you. Our next speaker 
is both a filmmaker and a political consultant. I mean, how about best of both worlds, huh? He's gonna join us on the stage and tell us a little bit about the bridge between aesthetics and audience. Let's welcome Matthew Taylor. How about those speakers, they're great, right? 101 years ago, an artist by the name of Marcel Duchamp bought a urinal, changed its orientation by putting it on its side, autographed it, Armut 1917, and anonymously put it into an art show. Now, the important thing about this particular art show is this was the Art Independence in New York, which was modeled after the French Independent in Paris. Both of these shows had a similar motto, no jury, no prize. It basically means that anybody could put a piece in the show for six bucks. And Duchamp was asked to sit on the board primarily because he was a French artist and had experience with the French Independent. So what's with the urinal then? Well, five years earlier, Duchamp did in fact enter a piece into the French Independent in Paris. And what happened? Well, the Cubists, who were the dominant art movement at the time, were very doctrinaire, and they said, nudes cannot descend the stairs, they can only lie down. And they kicked him out of the art show, the no jury, no prize art show, by the way. Well, five years later, he's in New York. And you see, the whole point of this artist independence show was that anybody could enter a piece without the fear of being judged by a jury. But since the American independence was modeled after the French independent, Duchamp, who, by the way, had been judged and kicked out of the show, knew that the American version had already betrayed its principles. And he set out to break the system with this urinal. Well, what happens? Well, it's a huge scandal, of course. It gets removed from the show for being indecent, and Duchamp goes on to break way more than some obscure art show in 1917. The urinal, or fountain, is known as a ready-made. That's basically an already-made object that becomes art because I say it's art. First, he eliminated the aesthetic from the art. Basically, art was traditionally paintings, sculptures, retinal, pleasing to the eye. You knew it was art because, you know, it looked like art. But a ready-made, well, what's not already made? How would you know if it was art or if it was just an object? Anyway, who could even define art after this? Since Duchamp had not actually made the urinal, how could you prove authorship? And then did an artist even have to make anything to be an artist? What about crafts? What about design? What about architecture? And really, a more critical implication of this urinal was that Duchamp separated concept from object. This was a scenario where an idea alone could be art without any object, meaning the idea or concept was the ready-made. It was irrelevant what you picked as a ready-made. The ready-made would completely destroy the definition of art forever, because now, well, anything could be art and anybody could be an artist. This allowed for appropriation, sampling, fair use, memes, parodies, performance art, um, ephemeral art, and this is why Duchamp is considered basically the father of conceptual art. He opened up a gateway for unlimited experimentation, creativity, and possibilities with the urinal, and also a lot of really bad art. He would influence Warhol, Johns, Coons, Rauschenberg, Beck, Lady Gaga, and literally thousands and thousands of more artists. But here's a question. How does this new art work? Well, it's easy to understand traditional art because you don't question whether a painting is art in the first place. But conceptual art, that's not about what you actually see with your eyes. It's actually about your mind. It's actually about what you think. When you walk through MoMA and you see the urinal on a pedestal, you don't use your eyes. You actually use your brain. Basically, because you have to ask yourself all these questions of, well, how did this get here? And, why is this here at all? And what does this mean? But you didn't ask any of those questions about Starry Night in the previous room because you just accepted that it's art or whatever that means. That is because the ready-made exists primarily to challenge your preconceived notions about what is art. The interaction between you and the object is one of thought reassignment. This is no longer a toilet. Your thoughts are reassigned because the concept of the object has been altered by its context and orientation. This all happens not with your eyes, 
but in your mind. The object is actually not the thing that changes. You are the thing that changes. So this brings me to my final point. What in the world am I talking about? Well, <laughs> it's a to toilet, right? Well, what is our object? A candidate, a cause, a bill? Well, you know, what we do is we communicate with the public that our guy, or proverbial toilet, is art in a way. And how do we do this? Well, we sell ideas by reassigning thoughts. We tap into our audience's hearts and their minds the exact same way you sell a ready-made. He or she is not a candidate or a cause, but a set of conceptual principles, elevated, elevated above all to be a pure belief. It is easy to sell an iPhone or a BMW, but to sell a candidate is simply to sell a concept. If you donate to this guy, it's not like you get a cool phone, but you get to participate in, in the idea of what he represents. This is the basis of the ready-made. It is only art if you believe that it's actually art, if you can be convinced. This is really the basis for all art, but the toilet is very extreme. Not everybody is convinced. I mean, look, it's 101 years later, we still argue about the validity of this toilet, and is it art, and what is art, and why does it matter? And that is why the ready-made is the most provocative art object of the 20th century, because the debate is still alive today. It's fundamental. What moves people to believe? In fact, our audiences believe in the concept of a Reagan, or a JFK, or an Obama as more than a candidate. They are belief systems just like those ready-mades. And we are like Duchamp, convincing the world to believe. In the end, art and politics is really not that different. We're both turning dog bleep into diamonds on a daily basis. The only difference is an artist can convince the entire world that a toilet is art. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are coming up on our last TED style speaker, and we've decided um, to take ourselves out of our country and into a country where running campaigns is way more challenging than it is here. So we, let's welcome to the stage Elisa Totaro. Okay. So let's start by talking a little bit about the Venezuelan regime. For those of you who don't know the Venezuelan regime, it's a dictatorship that has oppressed the Venezuelan people for almost 20 years now. It's a regime that harasses, that persecutes, that imprisons and even kills those who oppose them. It's a regime that have, has closed hundreds of media outlets and that has people scavenging for food on the trash it's a regime that has people living in food shortages with a crisis of electricity and water, and where nobody gets medical attention in the hospitals because there's no medical supplies and no medicines. And a regime that is directly responsible for the assassination of 159 people during the protests last year that I'm sure everybody here was aware of. So, Yes, it looks like an unbeatable Goliath, right, this regime? What do you think? Okay. We feel the same way, but we, and when I say we, I mean everybody that's working towards achieving change in Venezuela, we have won some battles. I know it's hard to believe, but we have won some battles, and we have lost others. But the truth is that the fight isn't over yet. And what we have done is that we have fought this Goliath with one secret weapon which is creativity. And you might wonder what I mean by creativity. Well, for me, creativity is just the ability to solve problems, to overcome obstacles, and reach a goal that at first seemed unattainable. For example, in Venezuela, we have a lot of censorship. And sometimes when we try to get our message in traditional media, we have to find creative ways to get the message across. Sometimes we have even tricked TV stations and newspapers into believing they were showing a safe message. For example, 
One time we were doing a um, campaign for Leopoldo Lopez, who is Venezuela's most prominent political prisoner and one of um, the opposition's leader in Venezuela. And we knew that TV stations weren't allowed to show his image, his voice, and even his footage. So what we did is we created a series of TV spots that showcased messages written and signed by Leopoldo that were received by the main characters of the spots and that generated a good reaction. And in this way, we managed to bypass the censorship that was imposed in the TV stations. And we managed to get Leopoldo into people's minds. Because as you know, well, the internet helps a lot, but it doesn't reach everybody as TV does. In the, in the case of Venezuela, specifically. So as you can see, it's pretty tough to do political advertising in Venezuela. But as you say here, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. And Venezuelans are very resilient, maybe too resilient. And we have taken the streets many, many times in the past 18 years, demanding for change. But the thing is that each year, the burden has grown heavier and the crisis has deepened. So it's harder and harder every time to keep people motivated, to keep people organized, centered, engaged. And this is where creativity comes in handy too. For example, last year, um, I'm sure you heard of it, uh, saw it in the news, uh, we had four months of continuous protests on the street. And what we did is we created a Facebook page called Venezuela Protesta, Venezuela Protests, where we taught people how to protest in a nonviolent manner. We taught them how to defend themselves from tear gas bombs, from rubber bullets, how to make, um, how to make a bulletproof vest out of x-ray sheets, how to disable the water cannon, uh, what to do if they got caught by the military forces. And we did a lot of infographics, web flyers, print flyers, animations, and videos such as this one. We didn't plan for this brave, brave woman to stand in front of an armored vehicle of the security forces. This wasn't planned. But as soon as we saw that footage, we knew we had to use that to get people motivated, to get people to want to protest longer and more. So you see, with this, what I want to say is that creativity is not only creating new, amazing things. It's also taking advantage of situations and elements that are already there and make them serve your purpose. Creativity is certainly a good tool to educate. It's a good tool to motivate and to organize. All these things are relevant when you're trying to defy the status quo of a regime. But the truth is also that when you're fighting a dictatorial regime, resources are scarce. And you get all the, all the doors shut in your face when you're trying to look for funding for campaigns because people are afraid to give money for a campaign that goes against the government, a government that controls everything. So proper funding is really, really hard to come by. So we always find ourselves having to do a lot with little money. And if that isn't a situation where you absolutely have to be creative, then I don't know what is. I wanted to show a stencil graffiti in this part because I believe that um, graffiti is one of the cheapest forms of propaganda and one of the most effective ones too. Nevertheless, when you, when you type the word, the word propaganda on Google, you're probably gonna get this as a result, like a bunch of typical war uh, posters or propaganda posters, classic propaganda. But you see, for me, propaganda is much more than that. Propaganda is the protest graffiti, is the outcry portrayed in a sign, is the, um, the declaration of purpose on a flyer. 
And when you're doing this sort of things when you want to communicate for or against uh, someone or something, or when you want to rally around a cause, you absolutely need to be creative in the origination and the execution of the idea. Uh, going back to the case of Venezuela, uh, it has been difficult to, to keep on finding creative ways to get to people after all these years. And some might say we have received quite a beating in recent years by the government, uh, especially this year with a call to fake elections that are going to be held next month in Venezuela. But this is what we do. We get up, we fight, we find new ways to push through. We find new ways to give hope to Venezuelans that change is possible. And in a nutshell, because I'm almost out of time, um, when you're working against a Goliath, you're going to need to bypass censorship, work with scarce resources, motivate, educate, and communicate. And what do they have in common? That they need creative thinking in order to be achieved successfully. You need to be creative to bypass the censorship. You need to use creative thinking to work with little money. Really, believe me, it's really hard to work with scarce resources. You need to be creative to keep people motivated after all these years. You cannot say the same message every time, right? Like every year, change, change, change. No, no more change. You've been telling us the same thing for 18 years. People don't believe it anymore. So you have to be creative so that people keep on believing that, that change is actually possible. You have to educate because people have to learn um, how to organize, how to protest in a nonviolent matter, for example. And of course, you have to communicate. And um, I don't want to leave you without saying that creative thinking is best produced when minds and efforts are combined. And this is why, this is why I want to ask you to share your thoughts and your ideas on how to battle a dictatorship. Share them with me and with all the Venezuelans that are trying to find new ways to bring about change in our country. And we won't give up, so don't give up on us. Thank you. All right, friends, that's the end of the 2018 TED Style Talks. Let's give one more round of applause for all our great speakers. We hope you all enjoyed it as much as we did in finding these awesome leaders in our industry. So we hope you have, from the, all the co-chairs to you guys, we hope you have an amazing conference. And uh, we'll see you around the sessions. Thanks.